And that is a clip from The Disaster Artist. And I'm delighted to say we have James Franco and Dave Franco in the studio. Gentlemen, how are you? Very, very good. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. I'm great. You are all right? This is James. That's James going second and that's Dave, that's Dave going first. Is it strange promoting a movie together? Is it, is it it's really oh. nice, actually. Uh, you know, some press tours can be very uh, exhausting. I mean, I guess all of them are exhausting, but it's nice to be traveling with a movie that we actually love because uh, the alternative is not very fun. Uh, talking we were just, <laughs> yeah, on the way in, we were just, we were talking about the real Greg Sistero, who my brother yes. portrays in the film. He spent a life, you know, the last 15 years of his life talking about this movie. Mm -hmm. But it's actually fun. Like, people love to hear about this film and Just the real Tommy. Just a mystery Wiseau. surrounding yeah. Tommy, yeah. Okay, all right. So we've set up a few ideas there just for people who haven't read the book, haven't seen your movie yet, and most importantly, haven't seen The Room. Just tell the story from the beginning as to what this extraordinary film is because this is not, we should say, this isn't the the movie Room, the Brie Larson movie. Mm -mm. Nothing to <laughs> no. do with that. This no. is The Room from 2003. <laughs> Just tell us about what that film is. Right. Um, the Room has been called the best worst movie ever made uh, or the Citizen Kane of bad movies. It was yeah. made, it was written, directed, and stars uh, this man named Tommy Wiseau. He has, uh, you can look him up online, he's long black hair, looks like it was dyed with shoe polish or <laughs> magic right. marker or something like that. Um, he dresses sort of like uh, a pirate mixed with a vampire, you know. Um, anyway, he made this film. He intended it to be um, a dramatic movie. He wrote the copy on the uh, poster a Tennessee Williams level drama, and he financed it uh, for six million dollars. It wow. does not look like it looks like it costs a lot less. It does. Uh, it does. <laughs> yes. um, and he distributed it on his own dime. Um, nobody saw it on its first run, but he kept it in theaters for two weeks to qualify for the Academy Awards. So that shows you where he was aiming with the film. Yes. After that first run, he got a theater called the Sunset Five in, in in Los Angeles to play it at midnights on the weekend. And slowly over time, you know, some film students from USC saw it and then told their friends and it just gathered steam and it eventually became this sort of cult thing in the vein of Rocky Horror Picture Show. And now, 14 and a half years later, audiences watch it at least once a month in almost every major city in the States. It plays here in London at the Prince Charles. We were told by the real Greg Sestero and Tommy Wiseau that the Prince Charles audience is the best room audience in the world. Um, <laughs> and now it's this crazy phenomenon. And Tommy then kind of rewrote the history of it. And after he realized everybody was laughing at it, he kind of said that he had, he had intended it to be a comedy. Uh, he says now of the room... You know, room is safe place. You can you can laugh, you can cry, do whatever you like, express yourself. Just don't hurt yourself. So and that's the that's the voice. Okay, that's, that's the, the yeah that's yeah the yeah. Character. So I play Tommy in the movie. Yeah, the three mysteries of Tommy are a where did he get the six million dollars? Mm -hmm. It says if you go on Wikipedia, it says that he got it um, selling like leather jackets to Korea or something like that. I don't know. That doesn't make any sense to me. He did have a denim retail store in, in San Francisco. He maintains to this day that, yeah, he got it selling, you know, Levi's jeans. Um, I, up to a week ago, I confronted him on it. I was like, Tommy, there's, you sold $6 million worth of Levi's jeans. And he's like, yeah, James, what do you know about retail? I'm like, <laughs> okay, I guess nothing. Um, uh, how old he is, he claimed he was in his... Probably in his late forties when he made the film, he claimed he was in his in his early twenties, and where he's from, he sounded like this. My guess would be, you know, Eastern Europe, but he said that he's from New Orleans, all American guy, and um, he's. So made, you, you said as you're none the wiser at the end of the film. Well, really. you know, I mean, I, I don't believe he's from New Orleans. No, no uh, one does. <laughs> one of the great things about Tommy is the mystery. And so with our film, we decided, you know, we wanted to kind of maintain that, that, that actually one of the fascinating things about him was the kind of 
character and persona that he had created and how tightly he holds on to that persona. On the other hand, what we got from the book that Greg Sestero and Tom Bissell wrote yeah. called The Disaster Artist is this very moving um, relationship story behind the, the movie. Dave, you play Greg. Yeah. yeah. And he's kind of our conscience, isn't he, through yeah. through the film, so that when, and, and it's important to mention, we see Tommy behaving outrageously, yes. terribly on set towards his actors and actresses. You're the, increasingly your character, Greg, kind of is wising up and challenges him. Yeah, so the the hardest part about playing Greg is the fact that he's making really bad decisions throughout this entire film, and it was my job to try to justify those decisions and make the audience understand why he is continuing on this journey with Tommy, who from the outside, Tommy seems like a madman. And so, yes, from the beginning, uh, Greg is a struggling actor. Everyone in his life is telling him that he is not going to make it. And then he meets Tommy. And as weird as Tommy is, Tommy believes in him and he encourages him. And that's invaluable as a young actor. And so on top of that, Tommy invites Greg to live with him in his apartment in L.A. And Tommy's just giving him a lot of stuff. Uh, and so when things start to hit the fan during production of The Room and Tommy starts to show kind of some of his darker sides, Greg, you know, he, he tries to uh, he tries to go with it and tries to just look at things from a different angle. And uh, eventually the bond between them just starts to thin. And uh, it's it's yeah, it's a weird, loving relationship that just ebbs and flows throughout. Yeah. So, James, you direct the movie. Mm. Do, and did you direct as James or did you direct as D Tommy? Yeah, yeah. Dave, <laughs> Dave can tell you. And we were, and we've sort of been thinking about it. Um, we couldn't think of another film where the director of the film was acting in it, playing a character who was directing his own film and <laughs> acting in it. Like, it was yeah. a very meta kind of uh, enterprise. Um so I actually didn't think about it that much. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to be the Daniel Day-Lewis of directors, but um, it was just sort of easier. Once I had all, you know, I was wearing a lot of prosthetics. It was two and a half hours worth of prosthetics every morning. It was just sort of easier to kind of stay in the voice and, you know, and direct them like that. I don't, but you have to ask. But he's a terrible director. So. Right. So I didn't go that far. There's, you know, there's this incredible uh, new documentary about Jim Carrey when he played Andy Kaufman. And he just stayed in Andy Kaufman for the entirety like of that Jim shoot. Jim Carrey wasn't even there anymore. Wow. To the yeah. extent that he was pulling Andy Kaufman type stunts behind the scenes of that movie. It's just stuff that never even made it on screen. He was just pulling it on the crew and everyone. I didn't go that far. Like, our movie, The Disaster Artist, is a frame around the making of The Room, right? That we And we know that The Room is not a well-made movie by conventional standards. Our movie, The Disaster Artist, does not necessarily follow the sort of aesthetic uh, lead of the, of the room. You know, it's very different. So I, I gave them direction that was... He, James Franco he direction. Was, yeah. I was just filtered through the voice okay. of Tommy. Yeah. Yes. So on, we we should say the cast. You got a fantastic cast. Yeah, incredible. You cast. have Seth Rogen, Sharon Stone, Brian Cranston, Judd Apatow. To, just to mention uh, a handful. Best. I asked you then, Dave. What did they make of being directed by James, <laughs> who they know, but channeling Tommy? Yeah. So that must have been strange. It, it was an adjustment <laughs> period for everyone. I I probably got used to it quicker than most, just because he's my brother and I know him, <laughs> and there's not much he can do that surprises me anymore. But. Um, for example, Seth Rogen, he had a very difficult time with it. It took him probably two weeks to get to the point where he didn't just laugh in my brother's face every time he saw him. And then and he's one of the producers of the movie. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had um, a bunch of cameos in the movie. So people would show up for one day. And every time a new person would show up, we, we would almost have to prep them and just let them know that. <laughs> Hey, by the way, it is yeah, James. <laughs> you're not going to really be around James today. It's uh, you're essentially going to be directed by Tommy Wiseau. But uh, <laughs> I think it just added to the meta weirdness of it all and put us in the mentality of what it might have been like to be on that set. I was thinking we interviewed Meryl Streep for Florence Foster Jenkins mm, mm. Uh, a while back. And there's a point in that movie 
where she is being laughed at. And she says, and it's, I'm, I'm paraphrasing her words, but she says, why are they laughing? And there's a moment where Tommy says the same kind yeah, of... And, yeah. and, and I, I was, she was eccentric, but behind eccentricity, I wondered whether there were some mental health issues. Mm. And I, so we talked, we talked about that. So I'm just trying to get at what, the kind of person that Tommy is. Is he deluded? Does he have some problems that he needs to talk through? I mean, why is it that he seems to not get what everyone else gets yeah i mean tommy's saga you know has many twists to it and tommy has adjusted to them um there's a tommy before the room and there's a tommy after the room before the room i don't think he's mentally ill i think he just i guess lacked total perspective uh, of himself or he just had the most belief, he just had complete belief in himself, you know, and because he, I'm holding up my phone case to you right now, that, and there's an image of Tommy on there quoting uh, the F James Dean film, Rebel Without a Cause, as he does in the movie. You're tearing me apart, Lisa, right? <laughs> and uh, Tommy does looks, couldn't look f more different than James Dean, right? He looks closer to Captain Jack Sparrow, you That's know, from true, Pirates yeah. of the Caribbean than James Dean, but he believed that he was James Dean and that, you know, his movie, The Room, would be, you know, a Tennessee Williams level drama. He kept it in theaters for two weeks on his own dime to qualify for the Academy yeah. Awards. When it came out and people laughed at it, he then kind of turned into this virtuoso showman and um, capitalized on that laughter, rewrote history, said he intended it to be a comedy, and has kept the whole show going for 14 and a half years. So there's something about him that is kind of brilliant as maybe as dense as he was early on. Uh, I think we've only got time for one listener's question. This is Tom Maybe, and he, he says this. What is Johnny's job? Does Lisa's mom get better? Is Johnny really the florist's best customer? Why do we never see Chris R again? Why have I devoted so much thought to this terrible movie? <laughs> okay, I'll give, I'll give you all the answers. All right. Uh, uh, Tom, uh, Johnny's jaw, he work at bank, he come up with all these great ideas and they steal his best ideas. Don't okay. you know that? Does Lisa's mom get does Lisa's mom get better? Uh of of course, but that you know, that that storyline where she, you know, got the results of the test back and she definitely has breast cancer, that just twist. Uh Is know, Johnny really the florist's best customer? Of course he best customer. You know, it didn't. She didn't know that it was him. <laughs> and why have I devoted so much thought to this terrible? No, movie? and Chris R. Oh, Chris, Chris R. R. They yeah. take. They, why yeah. do we never see him again? <laughs> because they take care of him. They take him to jail. They they disarm him. Take him away. And why and, have I devoted so much thought to this terrible? Because movie? the room is incredibly deep film, uh, <laughs> and um, it is safe place. You can laugh. You can cry. Do whatever you like. Express yourself. Just don't hurt yourself. James Franco, Tommy Wiseau, Dave Franco, Greg. I don't know how many people are in this room. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.